I'm going to share something special with you guys, but I, I'm going to do that in a minute. I just wanted to first say Happy Father's Day, all you guys that are dads out there. And uh, I wanted to read something, and then I'm going to share something special. But um, I found something this year I thought was interesting. Famous people saying stuff about being dads or about their dads that I've never seen before. Uh, this one says, for fatherhood advice, try looking your child in the eye. Get to know their name. That becomes important when you want something from them. And remember to feed them. That's about all you need. And that was some wisdom from Will Ferrell. Um, I like this one. A father carries pictures where his money used to be. Steve Martin. If there's one thing I hope my kids learned over the years is not to lose the TV remote. That was Neil Patrick Harris. Having children is like, oh, this is great. Having children is like living in a frat house. Nobody sleeps, everything's broken, and there's a lot of throwing up. That was Ray Romano. Now... I don't know, this one might offend some people, but, you know, hey, what can I say? Suck it up. Being a dad at bedtime is like being the designated driver trying to get your friends to leave the bar and get in the car. That was Conan O'Brien. Wisdom from some famous people. You know, we're bringing back something this morning that we kind of put away, said we were going to retire it. But I've had a lot of people say, oh, man, I wish we could see that again. So back by popular demand this morning, we're going to show you dad life. Yeah. So let's watch the screens. <laughs> this is dad life. It's how we live 24-7, 365. Check me. Gas station glasses, don't care what the masses think about me with my sweet goatee. I'm rocking my dockers with a cuff and a crease. I got that St. John's Bay and the clip for my piece. I look nice. I got dozens of dollars and that's right. It goes straight to my daughters and my wife. I'm a miracle dad, making magic with the checkbook is the talent I have. I roll hard in the yard with a 60 inch cut. Zero turn radius, my neighbors say, what? They be driving by, peeping my landscape. Yo, these greens got nothing on my manscape. Hydrangeas, begonias, crepe myrtles, ornamental turtles. Hold up, is that a weed in my fescue? Oh, no. Round up to the rest. It's the dad life. It's the dad life. Take my daughter to the party. It's the dad life. It's the dad life. It's the dad life. Shooting vids of the kids. It's the dad life. Roll up to the splash pad. 10 a.m. My whole entourage pops out the minivan. We splishy splashy for an hour or two. Then it's back to the house. Yeah. Prepping for the barbecue. Brocks, dolls, Wrecker is whatever. Get me on the Weaver, man, nobody does it better. Call me Lord of the Grill. I'm king of the coals. Nana secret recipe, you know how I roll. 1080p, 16 by 9. I'm rocking man cave status with a screen like mine. Keep your peanut butter hands off my 50 inch physio. Pop up the corn, roll the Disney video. <laughs> We got Aladdin, Jasmine, Abu, the genie. Hey. With kids like mine, everybody wants to be me. Sing the night night song and then it's off to bed. This is the dad life, no more to be said. It's the dad life, hey. it's the dad life. Oh. Get the mall, coaching ball. It's the dad life, it's the dad life. Hey. It's the dad life, oh. playing rough, fixing stuff. It's the dad life, it's the dad life. It's the dad life. Yeah, you know how we do it. It's the dad life. <laughs> it's the dad life. 
Isn't that neat? I mean, it's, it's almost timeless, although it's starting to get a little aged, but it's almost timeless, isn't it? I tell you what, the flip flown kind of, and, and that big thing sticking on his ear, too. But anyway, hey, here's the deal. Real dads, Cindy told us this, real dads love their children. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. How many of you brought your Bibles? If you brought your Bibles, hold them up. Old school's got pages. New school's got screens. You guys know we rock the U version app around here, right? And if you don't know anything about that, ask somebody. They'll be glad to show you how to download it. If you have it, you can open it up. And all my notes for today's sermon will be right there on your device. You know, when I watch TV, when I'm on the Internet, when I'm looking at social media today, it's clear to me, at least, that the world has, at best, a poor understanding of what real love is. I mean, they, 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 help, they talk about love and, and, and all this stuff, but the truth is, they don't know what real love is. I think the guy who had the best clue, he's been dead and gone for a thousand so years now, his name was the Apostle John. He talked about love in his writings, and in fact, in his writings, he gives what I think is the quintessential, perfect definition of love. It's simple, but it's profound, and I think it knocks the walls off of any other definition you want to put out there, And uh, because literally any other definition, I think, limits the scope of what true love really is. So are you ready for it? I want to give it to you. You ready for it? It's in your outline this morning. It's 1 John 4, 8. He says simply this, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. That is so profound, but it's so simple. If you're taking notes, circle God is love. Those three little words there, I don't know about you, but it ought to fill your heart up. Those three little words to me, speak warmth. They, they speak hope. And if these words are true, then it makes all the difference in the world. But I think we need to understand something as we look at this verse. We need to look at it correctly. It says, God is love. That doesn't mean that love is God. You tracking with me? That doesn't mean love is God. In other words, love does not define God. God defines love. Okay? And that's what I want to think about this morning as we walk through this. Much of what you and I hear of the word love being cast around kind of bears absolutely no resemblance to what John said it was. There's no resemblance uh, or even relationship to real love. And in order to understand real love, you got to dig a little bit deeper into this passage of Scripture. In this chapter, John reveals actually that there's four characteristics that make up what he calls real love. And, and I believe these four characteristics also define real fathers. They define real fathers in the same way and their love for their children. And so that's what I want to spend our time on this morning, looking at those four things. It's going to be short. I promise you this morning you actually will get out on time. OK, uh, I want the dads to go out and have a great day. But I do want to walk through these four things, four characteristics of a real father's love. The first one, a real father's love is personal. A real father's love is personal. First off, God's love is personal. It's a personal love. John begins this scripture by saying something important. First John 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. I think the key point here is that God's love is a personal love, okay? God, God's love is what causes you and me to get to know him in the first place, and it also causes him to get to know us. Because you see, when we're filled with, with that kind of love, when we're filled with God's love, 
it demonstrates that we are his children. Cindy was talking about that uh, when she had that epiphany moment with Dawn, where she realized that 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 we are gods. We're not we're not second class. You know, when when we accept Jesus, when we ask Jesus to come into our lives, we don't get that label stepchild. You know, we're we're not we're not any different than he is we get to be his kids just like jesus is his kid you know i mean we get all the benefits we reap all of the reward i think uh al tozer aw tozer i'm sorry he said it best um this is what he said he said the love of god is one of the greatest realities in all of the universe a pillar upon which the hope of the world rests but it is a personal intimate thing too god does not love populations he loves people god does not love the masses he loves men and women you see a real father's love is also personal i don't care if he's got one kid or he's got 101 kids, right? His his children, his grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, whatever. His kids are one of the top priorities in his life. A real father looks at his kids, he sees them, and you can really use this term, he knows them. He knows what they like. He knows what they don't like. He knows their quirks. He knows their their feelings. He knows uh, their look. He knows all of those things about their kids, and he loves them. Another thing is he knows what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are, and he loves them, and he loves them like no other. Every person also is important to God. And we talk about real love and we talk about God's love. God loves us warts and all, you know, we don't have to wait till we get better or a better version of ourselves before we ask God to come into our life. He loves us with the mud, the mess, the muck, the mire. He loves us the way we are. And that's important for us to understand. So many people think they have to clean their act up before they come to God. A real father looks at his kid when they got dirt all over their face and he loves them just as much. He looks at his kids when they've been wallowing in the mud. He might not be happy with them, but he loves them just the same. And that's the way God loves us. Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7 says, What is the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins. Yet God does not forget a single one of them. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. That makes me feel so good. (laughs) Doesn't that make y'all feel good? Listen, but here's the deal. The copper coin that that Luke's talking about was a a, a form of currency during the time of Jesus, during uh, that time in history. It was the smallest denomination coin in circulation. And it, it... Basically, it is about what like our penny is today. And pennies don't count anymore. You ever notice that? People throw them away, you know, leave a penny, take a penny. Most people leave a penny. You never see them take a penny, right? Um, if you've got change in your pocket, which for most of us today, that's kind of unique because we kind of use plastic all the time. But if you have change in your pocket, you put that out. You might grab the quarter, might need that, right? But that penny goes in a jar. And, you know, my dad did that. My dad collected so many pennies in his lifetime and died never doing anything with them. So I got to inherit them. And, and Dawn, you guys know that, John, y'all were over at my house when we moved. Probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 500 pounds of pennies. I called the bank. They went, we don't want them. And I went, but I I want the money that's that's that, that 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 they are. Sorry, we ain't taking them. I finally found one credit union that has a coin counting machine, and they said if you bring them in and you put them through the coin counting machine, and you can get a little printout, we'll put that money in your account. But otherwise, don't bring them to us either. 
I spent hours. Dawn would tell you, we were getting ready. When we got went to do our, I think it was our Vegas vacation, we wanted to have some extra spending money. So I am at this credit union with five-gallon buckets of pennies. And I would set at the machine and keep putting pennies in till the machine would overheat and we'd have to stop and wait, okay? I still have about 100 pounds of pennies at my house. The reason I tell you that is this. Nobody wants pennies. They're not valuable anymore, right? They, 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 they don't count at all. Well, it was almost the same way in Jesus' time. This copper coin was a nothing coin. Nobody wanted it. But what he, what Luke says here is you could take one of those coins and you could buy two sparrows for one coin. But here's a better deal. Here's a better deal. You could take two of those pennies. I'm sorry, you could buy two sparrows for that one coin. You could take two pennies, two copper coins, and you get five sparrows, okay? So that's, that's like a deal. But if you stop and think about it, that's where a saying that we hear a lot or used to hear a lot comes from. You ever heard the saying, um, a dime a dozen? You could get more than a dozen sparrows for a dime. Now, the reason I tell you that is this. Jesus, cared, Jesus said God cares about those sparrows. He cares about them, and they're worth nothing. How much more do you think Jesus cares about us? We are his creation. We are his masterpiece. You know, and I think a lot of times when you get to the place, and I've been there, I know we all get there, some days you just feel like you're worth nothing. Some days it, nothing is working like it should work. Nothing is, no doors are opening, no windows are opening. And you find yourself sitting alone thinking how insignificant you are, how unimportant you are, sometimes how unloved you are. But you're not. You're not. We're loved by God. Even the sparrows matter to him. How much more do we matter to him? You know, I've heard it said this way. We are the apple of God's eye. I wish I could say I made this one up, but I heard Pastor Jim one time say we are the bubble in his Pepsi. <laughs> Do you understand for real fathers, their children are the bubble in his Pepsi? A real father's love is personal. Fathers look at their kids and they see that value even when they don't. St. Augustine said, he loves each one of us as if there was only one of us. That's how powerful God's love is. A real father makes his kids feel the same way. A real father may have 5, 10, 20, who knows? Sorry, moms, kids. <laughs> Back in the old days, they did that anyway, right? But a real father loves each one of his kids as if they were the only one. So the first characteristic of a real father's love is that it's personal. I got to move on. Number two, a real father's love is proven. You see, God's love is a proven love. By the way, love is a verb. Love is not a noun. Okay. So love isn't love unless there's an action involved. And real love means a real action. In the case of God, it was a sacrificing of his son, Jesus, on the cross at Calvary for you and me. He loves us that much. John says in 1 John 4, 9, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. You see, God proved his love for you and me by the life and death of Jesus. If you ever doubt God's love, all you got to do is look at Jesus. If you ever doubt God's love, all you got to do is look at the cross. <clears throat> God's love took action. God's love, God's love was an action, sending Jesus to die in our place. Paul said it plainly in Romans 5, verse 8. He said, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, 
the problem with real dads, <laughs> a lot of times our children don't see the love we have for them because we're not present to demonstrate that love. So a lot of times real dads are out there in the world making money so that their kids can eat, making money so that they can have that right pair of shoes, making money so that they have the right brand of clothes, making money so that they have the latest gadgets, iPhone or Galaxy uh, phone, whatever it is, but dads are doing that. But when there's a problem, real dads step up to the plate. They're the first ones to stand and be in their, their children's corner. So first off, a uh, real dad's love is personal. And second, a real dad's love is proven. The third point is this, a real dad's love is protecting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul wrote what we call the love chapter. And in that, he said that love always protects and if you stop and think about it, that's exactly what God's love does for you and me. It is a protecting love. Look at what Paul, I'm not sorry, John said uh, in 1 John 4.10, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. You see, Jesus' death on the cross is not only a proven love, but it's also a protecting love. God sacrificed his son to save our lives. He sacrificed his son to keep us safe. Man, it just, that in itself just blows me away. God once described his relationship with people like this in Hosea back in the Old Testament. I even gave it to you from the New King James 11, 4. He says, I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. So when I read that, when I read that, my mind goes back to that Hebrew name for God, Abba, Daddy. I can see Daddy drawing his children close to him, maybe holding them, maybe putting them up in his lap to keep them safe. A real father's love is protecting. Now, I, I think about that now. You know, I've told this story. When, when I held Travis, I was the first human being on this planet to hold Travis when he was born. And I knew right then that I'd take you out if you tried to hurt him in a heartbeat. You know, and I don't know a real dad out there that won't stand up for his kids and go to bat for his kids. And if you try to hurt his kids, you're going to get whomped. That's what a real dad does. A real dad's love is protecting. I, 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 read, I heard the story and I copied it. I heard about it. I found it. You can find anything on the Google, okay? I'm just telling you, if you want to know something, go to the Google. You can find it. I'd heard about this story, and so I Googled the guy's name. The guy's name is Andrew Lynch, and it came up, and I was able to find it. So I want to read this to you. It says, Andrew Lynch's fatherly act of heroism was actually captured on Australian closed-circuit television. He was shopping with his elderly parents and with his baby near Sydney, Australia. As the family browsed, an out-of-control car smashed head-on into the storefront right at 45 miles an hour, straight towards the Lynch family. Heroically, the dad positioned himself to take the full impact of the vehicle while scooping up his young son out of the way and saving him from harm. Lynch's legs were crushed in the accident, but he was able to hold on to his son through the entire experience. When interviewed later, he said, I was thinking, I can take this hit. I can get better, but there's no way my son could take it. That's what God's love is. That's what a real father's love. That's a protecting love. He puts his own self at risk to protect his children. That's what a real father does. So a real father's love is personal, it's proven, it's protective, and finally, number four, a real father's love is perfecting. Let me put it another way. I said it earlier. God loves us the way we are. 
He loves us warts, scabs, mud, dirt. He loves us the way we are. But he loves us too much to allow us to stay there. That's what's so awesome about a real father's protecting love. See, God God knows our potential. The moment he saw us in our mother's womb, before we took our first breath, he knew what we were going to accomplish. He knew what we could accomplish. (laughs) And along the way, he perfects us so that we can be all that he created us to be. He wants you and I to have a heart like his. John explains it this way in 1 John 4, 12. He says, no one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is made perfect in us. So when I read that, it, 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 here's, here's the way I kind of figure that out in my own head. You know, we might not be able to see God, but when God lives in us, we change. We change. And we start conform. It may take, it may take years, but we start conforming to his image. And sooner or later, people are going to start to see Jesus in us. His love perfects us. His love makes us the best that we can be, the best version of ourselves. So I was thinking as I was writing this this week, I did this a couple of years ago, and I thought it would fit so good today. I want to challenge you. Me too. I said that that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13 as the love chapter. And if you remember, it says love is a lot of stuff in that chapter. You know, we usually use it at a wedding. It's it's so cool to read, you know. Um, But here's the challenge. Remove the word love every time it's repeated in 1 Corinthians 13. And in place of the word love... Put your name. Put your name. And so the challenge becomes, how far through the chapter can I get? How far through the chapter can you get before it becomes a lie? I mean, think about it. Because it kind of goes like this. I'm just going to say Joe. If there's any Joes here, okay, Joe, tell me to stop, okay? Okay. Joe's patient. Joe's kind. Joe doesn't envy. Joe doesn't boast. Joe is not proud. I'll take the heat off Joe. Mike does not dishonor others. (laughs) Mike is not self-seeking. Okay, Mike, I'll give you a break. John is not easily angered. John keeps no records of wrong. Danny does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Bill always protects. Mark always trusts. Tommy always hopes. Keith always perseveres. Steve never fails. I don't think any of us could get through that without lying. But what an amazing target to shoot for. We read those words and our hearts seem so far away from that, you know. But what if they weren't? What if our hearts were patient and kind? What if we weren't proud or rude or self-seeking? What if we weren't so easily angered? That's the one that's hard for me, I'll be honest. If I get spun up, it's like, how do I unspin, you know? What if we stopped keeping track of all wrongs done to us? What if we took no pleasure in evil, but rejoiced at the truth? What if our love always protected, always trusted, always hoped, and always persevered? 
What if those things were true? How would our lives be different? Dads, God in his wisdom said we are the head of our family. For a lot of dads, we've advocated that position. But what if we hadn't? How would our lives be different? How would people notice the difference? How would my kids notice the difference? How would my wife notice the difference? How about your co-workers? Would anybody sense a change? Understand for that word love, you do know we could replace it with God. And he is our example, dads. He wasn't wrong when he said, you are the head of your family. He wasn't wrong. Real fathers understand that. And I have to say, looking around this room this morning, I see a bunch of real fathers. And I'm proud to be associated with all of you. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 says, and by the way, this is a promise of God. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. <clears throat> And I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Understand, the more you allow God's love to permeate, permeate you and, and penetrate your heart, the more your heart will become like his heart. I got to close, but here's what I want to leave you with. Love. That's a word that most toddlers can say. That's a word that most young children can write with a big fat crayon. Yet it's a word that is so deep that God's pen can actually engrave it on our hearts. Love is the theme of a gazillion songs on the radio. Love is the topic of hundreds of movies on television and the internet. If you Google the word love, over a million hits pop up. And I would assume that love is the subject of thousands of sermons preached around the world. Yet none of these songs, movies, websites, or sermons convey what real love is any better than those three simple words, God is love. And it's God's love. It's his personal love. It's his proven love. It's his protecting love. And it's per his perfecting love that shows you and me what real love is all about. So I'm going to end on this Father's Day. Wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't it be amazing if those three words reflected our love for our family and our children? George is love. David is love. John is love. Happy Father's Day. Do everything you can to be the most real father to your children. Plant memories in them like the ones that Cindy shared this morning. Be who God called you to be, men. Step up. A real father's love is an example of God's love. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for real dads. Thank you for that love. Thank you for being the example for us 
And quite honestly, God, there is no way any of us can come up to that example. But help us try. Father, make up the difference between what all of us are capable of doing and what you want us to do to reflect your love to our children. Help us be better fathers. Help help us be real fathers. And help our children understand how much we love them every single day. You're an amazing father. Thank you. Thank you for the fact that you are love. In Jesus' name, amen.